Hello and welcome to History with Jackson. Today I've decided to give a little bit of change of scenery so you guys don't have to look at my bookshelves anymore. You know, it's really nice, it's really warm. I thought, you know, come outside in the sun and record today's episode. Now today we are following on from the death of Edward the Confessor and we are looking at what happened in 1066. So as mentioned last week, Edward the Confessor died in the January of 1066. It was very unclear as to who he had appointed as his heir, as his successor. So we're just going to have a quick sail in on who these people were. So first up is the House of Wessex bloodline heir, Edgar Etheling. He was Edward the Confessor's nephew. Uh, he was the direct bloodline heir to the throne. Next up is William the Conqueror, William Duke of Normandy. Now he believed that he had been promised the throne by Edward in an agreement in the 1050s. Then there is Harold Godwinson, the son of Godwin, Edward the Confessor's biggest rival. He was the most powerful noble in England and he believed that he had been promised the throne on Edward's deathbed. And then last is Harold Hadrada. Harold believed that the throne was his after an agreement between his co-king, former co-king Magnus, and the former king of England, Arthur Canute. So what happened after Edward's death? Now, Edward died in 1066 in January after a series of strokes. It's believed that on his deathbed he promised his throne to Harold Godwinson. However, in this period, the king was chosen by the Witten, which was the king's council, and they decided to elect Harold Godwinson as the next king of England. Now, it's thought that they elected Harold Godwinson because A, he was the most powerful noble in the country, B, was that he was the most equipped noble or candidate to protect England from the Normans and the Vikings, C, he was the most acquainted with English government at that point. Edgar Etheling was a very young child, so he didn't understand English government. William of Normandy hadn't experienced Anglo-Saxon government. And then finally, the promising of the throne on Edward's deathbed really played a part in that election. So how did fighting start in 1066? Now in January 1066, Harold was coronated at Westminster Abbey and he immediately set about securing and protecting his realm and key to this was getting the northern nobles on side. Now he managed to get these northern nobles on side and immediately set his army about to protect the south in anticipation of a Norman invasion or invasion by his exiled brother Tostig. Now Tostig started to attack England or tried to invade England in revenge for his brother playing a part in his exile from the country. Now Tostig initially tried to go up through the south but he was repelled by Harold's naval forces. So instead he tried to go north and reclaim his northern lands. Unfortunately for him anyway, he was repelled by Harold's new northern supporters and went off to Scotland to seek refuge. Now Tostig managed to engineer some of the starting of this fighting. He had powerful nobles or powerful kings as his allies. One was Malcolm III in Scotland who was protecting him and the second would later be Harold Hadrada of Norway. Now William at this time was Duke of Normandy and he was personally offended that Harold had taken the English throne. He felt that Harold was his vassal and that he had promised to allow William to take the throne. And in rejecting this, this oath, Harold was seen as personally offending William and William resolved to invading England to claim what he felt was rightfully his. Now, an important moment, important month in 1066 is the September. September is where everything comes together ready for that climax on the 14th of October. In September, William of Normandy had first attempted to cross the Channel to the south of England. 
unfortunately a windy channel had blown his ships off course and he had to try again. But in September, Tostig landed in the north of England with Harald Hadrada and 10,000 troops. Tostig, Harald Hadrada and these 10,000 troops set about raising and occupying northern towns such as Scarborough and York. In response to what Tostig and Harald were doing, King Harald II, Harald Godwinson, had to quickly muster his troops and march north. Now Harald set up camp in the city of York, or as the Vikings called it, Jorvik. Here he would surprise Harald and Tostig and be ready for a fight at Stamford Bridge. Stamford Bridge is a significant battle, not only in 1066, but historically. The Battle of Stamford Bridge represents the end of the Viking Age, and you'll find out why in a second. As Harold had taken Harold and Tostig by surprise at Stamford Bridge, they had quickly routed the Viking forces. Tostig had tried to get Harold Hadrada to withdraw and wait for his troops that were at the ships. However, Harold, being a big, strong Viking warrior who had won countless battles, felt that this would be a cowardly move, so marched straight into bat battle against Harold Godwinson. These forces were absolutely destroyed, and within this battle, Tostig was killed, and the end of the Viking Age happened when Harold Hadrada was killed as well. So that is why this moment is a significant historical moment, especially symbolizing the end of the Viking Age. Now quickly after this battle, Harold received news that William had finally crossed the channel with his troops. Leaving no moment for him to mourn the loss of his brother or celebrate the victory at Stamford Bridge, Harold had to quickly march south and meet at London to gather additional troops. Now William had landed in Sussex and set up camp in and around Hastings. But how did he manage to get to Sussex if Tostig had never met English land when he tried to invade in the south? William was aware of Harold's navy sitting at the Isle of Wight, so set a course to avoid this navy. Now Harold had decided that he needed to meet William in battle as soon as possible. Even though meeting as soon as possible would put him at a disadvantage given that most of his troops were still in the north, he felt that he needed to meet him to prevent William being met with any more reinforcements from Normandy. Now the two forces met and they met near Hastings. Harold had managed to get the high ground and he was possibly trying to surprise William in the same way that he'd surprised his brother and Harold Hadrada. Now early on in the beginning of the battle, Harold had the upper hand. He had a very strong shield wall and he had the higher ground. And he kept his troops very strong. William sent his knights to go up the hill and charge the Saxon shield wall. Whilst this did little, it did thin the Saxon troops. But one Saxon group of soldiers decided to chase some Norman soldiers down the hill. And in doing this, they broke rank and weakened the shield wall. William, who was thought dead at this moment, exploited this and he rallied his Norman troops and Norman knights. They cut off the separate band of Saxon soldiers and massacred them. But now the Saxon shield wall was thinning. And this, after several hours, was greatly thinned by the Norman archers. And they carried on for several hours and eventually Harold Godwinson was allegedly struck by an arrow. And with his standard fallen, Saxon soldiers deserted the field to try and protect themselves. This was a victory for William, this was a victory for the Normans and marked the end of the House of Wessex. Or did it? Whilst William had won the Battle of Hastings and had defeated the English king in battle, he had not had 
the English lords submit to him. After defeating Harold in battle, William offered the English lords forgiveness in return for allegiance. But this allegiance was not forthcoming. So what happened after the Battle of Hastings? Like I just said, William expected the nobles to rally around him and pledge their allegiance to him, but they didn't. Instead, the Whitson elected a new English king and they elected the last remaining member of the House of Wessex, Edgar Etheling. Angered by this move by the English nobility, William rampaged through the south, destroying towns and occupying major Anglo-Saxon towns and cities, such as Winchester and Canterbury. The northern lords fled the south and the Anglo-Saxon strongholds and went back to the north to protect themselves and their lands. Now William felt that his conquest, his invasion, had not finished yet. He needed to occupy London. So he marched to London and here Edgar Etheling and the archbishops submitted to William. This ended the House of Wessex, an Anglo-Saxon rule over England. And this represented William firmly conquering England. He was now King of England. Now, if you want to know what happens next week, tune in next week where we are looking at William the Conqueror. Now, this was very a brief, quick sailing into 1066 and the events that happened in this year. Now, as always, I would like to recommend some books, um, the, the ones that really helped me with this episode. So, so firstly, like I mentioned last week, it is Simon Sharma's A History of Britain. This is a really great book and it has a really, really good chapter on the Norman Conquest. It outlines the reasons why it happened, but also what actually happened in the conquest. And it's got a really, really strong part on the Battle of Hastings. The next book that's really, really helpful is Gwyn's King's and Queens of England, an indispensable history of England and her monarchs. This is really great for just looking at Harold's uh, very brief and short reign that went from January to October in 1066. So if you want to look at Kings and Queens, please get this book. I think this book's absolutely amazing. And if you want to look at the history of England across three volumes, Simon Sharma's book is absolutely amazing. I want to thank you once again for watching my videos. I really appreciate everyone who watches. If you are enjoying this series, please like and subscribe. It really helps me out and it will make sure that you guys get to be notified about my content a bit more. Now, if you want to keep up with me in the meantime, all my social medias will be in the link below. And if you want to head to my website, it's www.historywithjackson.co.uk. I'm starting to collate a bit more content on there. I'm looking to restart the blog with a few blog posts on my specialism. Now, in the meantime, thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you guys next week when we talk about William I or William the Conqueror. Thank you very much, guys.